Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Carl Dizeroth. Carl is a psychiatrist and neuroscientist at Stanford University, and he's one of the co-inventors of a neuroscience research technique called optogenetics. Carl and I discussed a number of things, including what optogenetics is. It's a technique that allows researchers to use light to actually control what cells in the brain are doing and thereby control animal behavior. If you've never heard about this technique before, this is going to be a really good podcast for you. Carl describes what that technique is and how exactly it works and what its implications are for both neuroscience research and our understanding of the brain, as well as the treatment of human disease and its other potential applications. Carl also discussed his new book called Projections, which was released recently. Its subtitle is A Story of Human Emotions. And in the book, Carl combines his knowledge of the brain's inner circuitry with a deep empathy for his patients to examine what mental illness reveals about the human mind and the origin of human feelings. We discuss several stories from the book, which center around some of the patients he's treated. This also gave us the opportunity to discuss neuropsychiatric diseases of the brain, like autism, and we discussed some of the patients that Carl has seen over the years and how his research in basic neuroscience and his invention of new techniques for understanding the brain in that research actually interface with his ability to understand and treat his patients. The book is also beautifully written, and Carl clearly has a wonderful grasp of language, which he uses to great effect. Uh, a lot of the chapters about his patients involve his use of language in a way that mirrors their actual disorder. So, for example, in a chapter which involves a patient with mania, the language is very manic. And in other chapters, the language is used in different ways to reflect the underlying disease of the brain that the patient actually has. It actually reminds me of the book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Oliver Sacks. That was a very important and influential book to a lot of people written years ago, and it's really powerful because because it helps give you an understanding and kindle an interest in the brain by telling human stories, human stories that involve patients that actually have problems with their brains and using observations of those patients to actually provide a deeper understanding of ourselves. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. If you find this podcast interesting, please like, share, and subscribe. You can learn more about the podcast and download episodes at www.nickjacomas.com. And you can also sign up for the Mind and Matter newsletter, which is a free weekly newsletter where I provide updates on the podcast, including upcoming guests, point you to interesting research that has to do with the mind and the brain, and link you to other interesting things which I think are noteworthy. And with that, here's my conversation with Carl Dizeroth. Dr. Carl Dizeroth, can you give everyone a uh, just a brief intro into who you are and what you do? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Carl Dizeroth. It's really nice to to be here. Thanks for inviting me on your your podcast. Um, I'm a professor of bioengineering and psychiatry at Stanford, and I'm in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute as well. And we uh, in the lab develop ways of studying the brain, and we use light in really interesting ways, uh, including a method called optogenetics which lets us uh, control things that happen in particular cells in the brain while animals do interesting things. So one of the things that's interesting about you is you're a neuroscientist. So you have a lab where people are studying basic research questions and applied research questions in neuroscience, but you're also a physician, you're a psychiatrist and you see patients. And then the other thing that we'll talk about is this new book that you've written called Projections. So can you almost, why don't you walk everyone through what, uh, I'm, I'm sure every week's different, but what does a week look like for you in terms of the balance of the research, the writing and the seeing of patients? Yeah, those are two other sides to my life you bring up. I'm right here in my psychiatry office uh, right now. This is where I see patients in my clinic. I focus on uh, treatment-resistant depression and also patients who are on the autism spectrum. And then uh, I do some inpatient work as well. Uh, one week a year, I do some uh, acute emergency uh, inpatient uh, attending work. And I've been doing this for many years. It's a big part of my life uh, conceptually, 
Uh, but I, and the reality is I spend most of my time in the lab doing uh, neuroscience and, and uh, developing technologies. So uh, on, a, on a weekly basis, I'm really in the lab. I'm a neuroscientist. We're doing uh, experiments, trying to understand as much as we can how the brain works. And then the, the psychiatry side, the clinical work is, is, is always there. It's, a, it's something I keep returning to. Uh, it's a big part of my identity. Uh, but it's not as big a fraction of my life as the as the neurosciences, and then the writing that the writing the book uh, projections. This is in many ways this has been going on uh, for just about twenty years. I've been working on this in in various ways. I wrote the first chapter twenty years ago, uh, <laughs> right after nine eleven, and I've been accumulating thoughts stories, experiences, ideas along the way. And then it really, uh, uh, but not at a full burn, not, not in, the, in the intense way of, of generating the book until just in the last uh, couple of years. And then uh, I've turned up the intensity of that quite a bit. And uh, that was an unusual couple of years. It was uh, fun. It was exciting. It was thrilling to, to be a writer, something I'd always wanted to be, something I'd always enjoyed. And that was sort of late night, early morning, um, intense bursts of, of writing. Um, I loved it. I was sort of addicted to it. I still, uh, now I want to write more now that I've rediscovered how enjoyable it is uh, uh, to write that way. So, you know, it's a week uh, of my life is, is hard to describe uh, these days. And I think that's a good thing. Hmm. But it's mostly, it's mostly on the research side. Mostly research, yeah. So the book is titled projections, a story of human emotions. So briefly, what is it about? How is it structured? And what's the significance of the title for you? So each, um, each chapter in the book is centered around one or two uh, human stories, stories of people who have gone beyond the, the bounds, the realm of normal or healthy, let's say, uh, a human experience into realms that are are uh, causing immense suffering uh, uh, to the patient in the in the psychiatry space, and there are stories that are uh, told uh, from the in, in some cases from the perspective of a of a patient. Uh, there is a fair bit of imagination to get inside the thoughts and the feelings of patients. Uh, there are uh, uh, historical and prehistorical. Uh, flights of, of imagination, you could say, uh, trying to connect the experiences of human beings today with human beings over the course of, of human history, and connections to my own experiences as well, and uh, importantly, uh, connections to the science, to the excitement that's happening in neuroscience these days, uh, driven by our ability to to carry out explorations that we had wanted to for so long and, and not been able to. And so it's, it's, it's meant for the general public. It's meant for everybody. It's written in a way that anybody, uh, uh, I think, can read it or understand it. And it's centered around human beings who are uh, uh, in altered states that relate to psychiatry. There's, there are stories uh, that relate to eating disorders, to schizophrenia, uh, to borderline personality disorder, to, to grief that comes with loss, bereavement, uh, dementia, um, and uh, several others. And each of these are, are, are I think, rich in, in uh, human emotion, but also in new insights that have only been available to us very recently. <laughs> so that's, that's the picture of the book, and I'll talk about the title in a moment. Is that uh, any other questions on that, or I could dive right into the title? No, no, go for it. Yeah. So the title is interesting. The, the title projections, it has meaning for people from all walks of life. There are, uh, there's a psychiatry meaning, there's a neuroscience meaning, and then there's a uh, lay public, uh, general public meaning of projections. When we think about just as, as people in the world, we think about projections, you might think about a projector that's... Uh, sending uh, an image out, there's something within the projector, there's some light and there's, a pro there's something within the projector that changes how the light is, is uh, passed out and propagated and, and projected out into the world. And so a projection is something that reveals using light, uh, 
it reveals what's within. It reveals something that's within and makes it clear uh, for everybody on the outside. That's how we think about projections normally. But in neuroscience, Projection has a meaning, which is a long range connection from one part of the brain to another. And uh, this is something that uh, is a physical material structural component of the brain. It's part of how the brain is built. It's how different parts of the brain exchange information, how they work together and how they give rise to the complex states that we have like anxiety is built from projections. Anxiety is a state that we all know. We have uh, physiological changes like heart rate and respiratory rate changes. That's one thing that anxiety is. Anxiety also has behavioral changes. It makes us not do things that we would otherwise do. And it also feels bad. That's another thing about anxiety. And it turns out all these parts of anxiety are built by projections, connections starting from one part of the brain and going to another that go out and get these different features and bring them back. And so that's the neuroscience meaning. And then finally, projection has a meaning in, in psychiatry as well. Psychiatry talks about projection as a way of uh, describing how people will sometimes uh, impute their own internal state onto other people. It's a way of uh, Sometimes it can be helpful, sometimes it can be harmful, but it's a way of understanding other people uh, by thinking about yourself and what's inside uh, yourself. And sometimes we do it correctly, sometimes we project ourselves on other people correctly, and sometimes uh, incorrectly. And so this, this uh, turned out to be a very uh, felicitous word that, that uh, helps unify the different themes of, of the, the book together. And that's, that's where the word came from. What's funny is that in other languages, projections doesn't always uh, translate. And so the, the Dutch version of projections just came out, but it didn't have all those rich connotations in Dutch. And so <laughs> the title, which uh, uh, is uh, in Sichten instead, which means insights, which is, a, uh, I think, a, a nice way of, of achieving the same uh, goal. But even the, the UK version, uh, it turns out projections in, in, in the United Kingdom has more of a negative connotation. And so the title there is Connections instead of Projections. So mm -hmm. we even had to uh, translate it into uh, British English. Interesting. Yeah, language, language can be funny like that. And you mm -hmm. talk about in the book how on the psychiatry side, when you're seeing patients, language is in many ways the most advanced tool that you have. You, you talk about how you know, compared to you know, the best drugs, the best microscopes, the best physical inventions that we've that we've innovated, uh, psychiatry still very much relies on the use of language, listening to the patient and talking to the patient in order to, to do that part of what you do. Can you expand a little bit about the importance of language in your psychiatry practice? It's a great question. Language is still uh, really the heart and soul of psychiatry. We don't have objective lab tests in psychiatry uh, that like a blood test or an imaging study that definitively at, in a single person will tell you this is the psychiatric disorder that this person has. And instead we have words. That's even when we do quantitative measures like rating scales, when we measure and quantify depression or autism, it's all essentially done with, with words and that has to be done artfully. You, you, you can't just blunder into a, a psychiatric interview, psychiatric interview and and ask a series of questions or, 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 or just check boxes. There has to be a, uh, a intuitive and, and careful and, and, uh, and practiced use of, of words, much like a, a, a surgeon's uh, tools in, in many ways. And the art and the science of that is something that always intrigued me about psychiatry. And Language um, was also a passion of mine from a very early age. I was always uh, enthralled by how words have power, have emotional power in ways that can be surprising and, and, and thrilling and shocking. And uh, so for once I realized that psychiatry was, was so intensely verbal in ways that mattered and, and that was the whole thing, that was all of it, that was one thing about psychiatry that, that really intrigued me and, and still does to this day. Hmm. You, uh, you use language in some interesting ways in the book. In the prologue, you, 
tell the reader that you're going to sometimes write from the patient's perspective. And you even state that you're going to talk about altered states using altered language. So the, the state of the patient's actually reflected in the language that you're using in the book. Can you give an example of this from the book and, and why you chose this stylistic decision? Yeah, this is something I really wanted to um, make sure that happened, that the feel of the disorder could be felt in some way by the reader. And I adapt that in each chapter to the nature of the, the illness. So in the chapter, there, there are a couple chapters where uh, the nature of the illness is uh, exuberant, over the top, uh, you know, rich and, and dynamic mania being one of them. So there's a chapter on bipolar disorder where uh, one of the poles of bipolar is mania. And with mania, people have extremely high volumes of, uh, of words that, that uh, come out with, and with pressure and uh, with, uh, honestly, a great uh, richness and, and charisma and, and complexity and, and humor. Uh, it's a uh, extremely intense stream of, uh, of over the top, uh, but, but uh, still emotionally compelling uh, uh, words. And so in that chapter, uh, you, you see the same kind of uh, writing style used. What I'm trying to do is to convey that, that feel of, of, of mania with, with the words. Other chapters, the chapter on, on uh, uh, psychosis or what turned out to be schizophrenia, and there in that chapter, there's a, a fragmentation or a breaking apart of, of, the, of, the, of the words in a way that relates to uh, uh, some of the physiology of schizophrenia and perhaps some of the patient's internal experiences. And there's a chapter on grief, which honestly, uh, it, and tears and, and crying and, and the loss with, with bereavement that um, is is harder uh, to get through. Even having written it, I, I still can't get through it without tearing up. And 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 that even though I've, I wrote it and I, I've read it, and it still affects me. And and uh, and I've heard from many other people uh, from them as well in a similar way. And so that's the goal of the language in each chapter. It's, it, it can be, it's extreme in different ways, but it's, it's adapted to uh, the disorder and the, the human story that's, that's at the core of that chapter, that story. I think before we go further, it would actually be good if you could describe and define for people the difference between psychiatry, neurology, and neuroscience. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm a psychiatrist and, and my wife is a neurologist. So we have a uh, that that tension is is in our own house as well. Um, you know, they psychiatry and neurology uh, used to be unified, and and uh, this hopefully uh, perhaps someday they, they will be again. But psychiatry and psychiatric disorders they fall into this category where right now we we can't point to a material uh, uh, a reason for the disorder. There are a lot of genes that are linked to psychiatric disorders. There are um, imaging studies that on average, if you ever look over thousands of patients, you can see there are you know, some consistent uh, uh, differences that can be picked up. But in general, uh, a useful summary is that in, in psychiatry, we can't point to a particular uh, part of the brain or a measurable that gives us confidence that here is the reason, this is the nature of the illness, this is the physical material form of the, of the disorder in the way that with congestive heart failure, you know that it's a, due to a weakly pumping heart and you can point to the pump and you can measure how the pump is, is weaker. That we don't have in psychiatry. You do have that in neurology. So in neurology, if you have a stroke or you have a seizure, uh, you can point to exactly the part of the brain uh, that's that's causing it, and you can describe why that's happening, and and the material physical nature is is clear. That's probably the simplest way to describe the difference between uh, psychiatry and, and neurology. Those are clinical uh, uh, disciplines that focus on the, the brain, but but the nature of the illnesses are uh, different in part because of our limitations of what we can do. <laughs> 
And then neuroscience is, is the basic study, the fundamental study of nervous systems and neurons and the brain cells that make everything happen. How do they work? How do the properties of the system arise from the properties of these components? I see. So, so neurology is really when there's something physically wrong with the brain that you can point to. There's a lesion in a particular area. In psychiatry, it's just more mysterious. It has to do with the function, which is invisible. Yeah, it's physical in both ways, but but uh, we can point to it in neurology. I think mm -hmm. that's the, the simplest uh, summary. So turning now to the neuroscience side of this, the the understanding of what's going on in the brain, at one point in the early part of the book, you write that the intersection of electricity and chemistry somehow gives rise to everything that the human mind can do, remember, think, and feel. And it is all done with cells, which can be studied and understood and changed. So you really take this view of you know going down to the cellular level and talking about understanding cells in the brain and actually changing what they do in order to gain an understanding. So I thought this would be a good spot for you to talk about optogenetics, what this tool is, and how it connects with our ability to, to get that level of understanding of the brain. Yeah, so this is, this is, a, this is a great uh, spot to, to get into that key question, as you say, and that, and that excerpt you just read uh, highlights the, the key aspect, which is changing, and changing at the level of cells. So, Historically, in neuroscience, you know, it's it's uh, you know we've always wondered what makes things happen in in the brain. The brain does amazing, wonderful things. What's actually going on that makes it happen? Sensation, cognition, action. How does it work? And we know the brain is made up of cells, and we know it does these amazing things. Now, how do you begin to study this? Well, you can first of all, you can observe. Okay, you can you can listen. You can look. And there are different ways of doing this. People can put in electrodes that listen. You can pick up on the electrical chattering of cells as animals do things. And this has been a wonderfully productive part of neuroscience, just listening, just observing, seeing what's happening during sensation, cognition, and action. And we can see that different cells fire away differently in different uh, moments. And this can be studied to, with a great effect and with great insights. But you don't actually know what's causing things to happen. You don't really know if those cells are making something happen, if they're important for what you think they're important for. And you don't know how causally, how these interesting processes emerge from the properties of the components, from the activity of the cells. And you could stimulate electrically, you could send in current, you could send in electricity, but every neuron in the brain works with electricity. And so there's no specificity if you do that. If you send in electricity through an electrode, you stimulate every cell and every connection, every wire effectively that happens to be passing near that spot. And you can get a regional understanding. You could say, okay, this part of the brain maybe does something more like this because I can see the animal's behavior changes when I stimulate this region. But that's a, a fairly limited uh, level of understanding because you're not getting down to these elemental components, the cells. And that's been such a productive step in essentially every other field of biology and medicine to get down to the cellular level because we know, we found many times from field to field, from disease to disease, the cellular level is where important things happen. It's a very useful level of inspection and intervention for treatment and understanding. And with optogenetics, what we do is we provide that cellular specificity of control. We allow action to be caused in specific kinds of cells and even specific individual cells. And we do that using light. Now, almost no neurons respond to light. It's pretty dark inside the brain. There's no reason for them to respond to, to light, which is great because if we could confer some light sensitivity onto some cells versus other cells, that gives us some specificity. That means we can say, okay, when we shine light now, only some cells will be active and others won't. Very different from the electricity case because all neurons respond electrically. 
And so that's what we do with optogenetics. The question is, how are you going to do that in a way that actually works in a way that's versatile and powerful and, and generalizable and works across animals and works in different behaviors? And so the way we uh, uh, figured out how to do this was to take a gene uh, from microbes, single-celled organisms, and we can do this from algae, we can do this from ancient forms of bacteria, archaebacteria, and we take genes that respond, that encode proteins that respond to light by moving ions, moving charged particles across the membrane of cells. So proteins that turn light into electricity. And these are beautiful natural proteins evolved by nature over millions of years. And these are called microbial opsins. Microbial because they come uh, from microbes and opsins, these are a class of protein that is really good at absorbing photons. And they use a little vitamin A-like molecule called retinal that's embedded within them to receive the photon, absorb it, and cause a change to happen in the protein, in the uh, uh, full protein that allows it to move ions across the membrane of the cell, create electricity. And so that's, that's how it works. Uh, there was a, it took a number of years to get all that working to get it to this level where it is powerful, robust, generalizable, where it works uh, across systems. But we uh, were able to get this to happen. We use genes, for example, that are called channel rhodopsins that come from single-celled algae. We can put them into specific kinds of cells, like the dopamine cells in your midbrain or your serotonin cells or the cells in one layer of your cortex, but not another layer. Uh, and we can ask questions, what happens when you then shine in light and you can turn some of these opsins will send in one kind of ion, others will send in another kind of ion. We can turn cells on or off. Uh, some respond to different colors than others. And so we can use different colors of light as well. We can even guide little light spots and turn on neurons asynchronously or synchronously. We can pick out groups, ensembles of neurons. All of this while animals are behaving, carrying out complex tasks of sensation or cognition or action. And we can see how causality happens, how cells make things happen, how signals propagate and how they lead uh, to the beautiful and mysterious things that the brain is capable of. So you can take something like a mouse and you can use molecular and genetic tricks to literally put these light sensitive proteins into specific cells and specific parts of the brain. And then you can effectively control the cells and thereby the behavior of the mouse by shining light onto these cells. How do you actually get the light into the brain? Yeah, uh, we use a couple methods. The first method we used was with fiber optics and lasers. And that uh, we described in 2007, uh, we used a laser diode and a fiber optic, nearly hair thin. We put that into uh, one side of a mouse's brain. And that turned out, that's still now, almost 15 years later, that's still the workhorse of optogenetics. People still use this uh, uh, fiber optic uh, interface. It it's in, gives incredible versatility. You can stick that in any part of the brain. You can put multiple of these in and you can uh, carry out delivery of light and also collect light back. You can actually get information back out as well. Um, that was, that's been supplemented now by another method that, that we and our colleagues developed beginning about 2012, where we guide uh, spots of light with holograms. We basically make uh, 3D projections of many little spots of light, uh, basically using a liquid crystal based hologram. And we can make those single cell sized spots of light. So we can play in into the cortex, for example, the surface covering of the brain, we can play in many uh, spots of light uh, and control cells that way. But still the fiber optic interface is, is the dominant method. I want to give people that aren't familiar with this a very concrete picture of, of what this actually is. So I'm going to do a screen share and show a video clip. And for people listening on the audio version, We'll, we'll try to do a good job of describing what's going on, but this will be on YouTube as well. So, can you see my uh, screen, Carl? Yep, yep. So, 
I've got a video of Carl from a lecture he gave some years ago, which is on YouTube. I'm going to hit play, Carl. And if you could just okay. describe what's going on and unpack this for people who've never seen something like this before. Yeah. So this is a mouse. You're going to see a little blue dot appear right there. And the mouse starts circling left immediately. Um, and when the blue dot turns off, you're going to see the mouse stop circling. One more circle around. And then the blue dot will turn off right here and we'll stop. Okay. So <laughs> what's going on there? Why did this mouse suddenly start circling left? Like it really wanted to turn left and then immediately stop and then just look up at us like it's doing right now. Um, well, what's going on here is there's a fiber optic uh, in the mouse's brain and the right part of its brain. And as you all might know, the right part of the brain controls movement toward and attention uh, toward the left side of the world. And this is in uh, an area uh, called anterior motor cortex M2 that uh, is responsible for some of the um, uh, uh, motor planning or movement planning that uh, mammals do. And what you can see there is that uh, we've been able to take an animal that was just sitting there not doing anything and uh, we made it act as if uh, it was really wanting to turn left and turning left and it didn't appear in pain or distressed uh, when it, it simply started doing that. And when the light was turned off, it stopped. And so this is the essence. This is a very vivid demonstration of, of causality in neuroscience. We now know it's not a correlation anymore. We know that these cells in this part of the brain in this, and this happened to be layer five of the six layers in cortex. And we now know that these, uh, uh, this particular layer, these cells can cause directly cause, um, uh, initiation of this uh, uh, complex motor plan. And this is a, a simple action, uh, you know, circling left. But what's happened uh, since that moment, which was in 2007, is uh, this same method, same fiber optic and, and channel rhodopsin based user interface uh, has been uh, adapted to virtually, you know, every kind of behavior you, you might think of. We now know using this method, the cells and the connections that are causally involved in, in uh, aggression and parenting and uh, hunger and thirst, uh, you know, motivation, uh, memory, uh, uh, social interaction in general, uh, defensiveness, uh, and uh, any, any number of other things you might uh, be interested in and would consider. And we now know that uh, uh, aspects of how activity in a few cells propagates out and spreads to other cells and, and, and recruits and begins to recruit these complex uh, uh, brain states and behavioral states. So I could imagine, it's very easy for me to imagine two different types of responses that people might have to seeing something like that for the first time. One type of response might have a positive valence. People might be very excited or, or curious about how that works. They're very happy to see something like that. It's, it's very interesting. I could also imagine someone responding with an, a negative valence reaction and, and being almost fearful or anxious at what the implications of something like this might be. Can you actually use this as an opportunity to explain the concept of valence to people and what those two types of reactions um, tend to be in people? Yeah. Well, valence is a word we use all the time. We think it's, it's kind of I mentioned anxiety earlier, and I mentioned the fact that anxiety feels bad and release of anxiety feels good. That's an example of valence, uh, just the sign of something, if you will, S-I-G-N, the just is it positive or negative? How does it, what's the subjective net experience? And I never know if another person, what their true inner experience is like, but I know if they report something as positive or negative, and I know how it feels in myself as positive or negative, that's, that's valence. And different people could respond to the same thing with positive versus negative valence, depending on who they are. So you look at that video and you, you know, uh, <laughs> it kind of depends on your perspective or the same person might have, have a mix of, of positive and negative. When you look at that, some people, and we certainly were when we first did those experiments in 2007, we had a very positive reaction because this was the moment when we really knew optogenetics was going to work. So everything, you know, nothing to that point had been, a, a, you know, a freely moving mammal, which was, you know, the, the sort of for us the, and for 
for a great many people, the Holy Grail. You know, how do you how do you get to that that moment? And we didn't know until we saw that circling that optogenetics was really going to work in that sense, and it brought together all these things: the fiber optic interface and the microbial proteins and the the, the uh, delivery strategy. So it was a culmination of of years of work uh, for many people in the lab, and it, it made us, you know, it, <laughs> we were incredibly excited. Okay, at the same time, I fully realize uh that that's also a little disturbing when you look at that video or even a lot disturbing if you if you look at that and you think you know that here's an animal that was doing nothing now it's suddenly doing something very specific and now it's stopping and then you put that in context of what's been done since you can instantaneously induce an animal's you know violent aggression instantaneous violent aggression by a very specific optogenetic intervention. You can turn it on and off instantaneously, just delivering a few spikes of activity to a few cells. You can make an animal uh, seemingly want to and actually act to carry out, you know, uh, violence against another member of its own species. Turnable on or off instantaneously. Uh, you know, the work done you know, very remarkable work done by Catherine Duloc's lab at Harvard looking at parenting. You know, we can, you can turn on or off parenting uh, behaviors very specifically, uh, optogenetically. You look at all these, these things and it's, it's a, it, it frames a very interesting question. First of all, if anybody had any doubt that the actions of complex mammals can be and are uh, dictated by a few blips of activity in a few cells, well, <laughs> have no doubt anymore that that's certainly known. And of course, those cells act through other cells and they recruit cells they need to give rise to the actions. But, but at some level, at a causal, fundamental and specific level, complex actions and decisions are dictated by a few spikes in a few cells. And, and when you look at that, that has you have to deal with that. You have to put that in context of questions that uh, relate to, to free will and the, the ways we think about combating violence and aggression in society. And uh, it, it doesn't answer, I would say, any very, very deep eternal philosophical questions, but it frames those questions very well uh, in ways that are objective and concrete and, and quantifiable. And so even, I would say, even if you have a, as I certainly understand, a, a, a negative valence reaction to that video, I think in the end, it, it also can be turned positive because it, it, it helps you, it, it provides a, a launch pad for us to begin to understand ourselves uh, uh, more deeply. So is it possible to use this technology in humans is it being used in humans today? And how might this technology be used in humans in the future for, for good or for ill? Well, it is, uh, it is used in, in human beings now. Uh, so my colleague, uh, Botan Roska in Switzerland, uh, just a, a few months ago, described the optogenetic uh, uh, restoration of light sensitivity into the eyes of a blind person. Uh, and this was... Uh, something he had been working on for a very long time, more than 10 years. He and I published a paper together, uh, uh, yeah, about 10 years ago in science, showing that you could do optogenetic control of light responses in, in a human retina uh, taken from someone who had passed away, a, a cadaveric human retina, and we showed that optogenetics worked in that setting. But he kept working on that over the last 10 years with a goal of vision restoration in people who are blind. And so he worked hard on all the uh, those intricacies of clinical trials, which can be complex, uh, to say the least, as you well know. And he succeeded in the end, uh, just in this past year, uh, uh, demonstrating conferral of light sensitivity onto somebody uh, in ways that, that they didn't have before due to blindness. And so that's a very interesting example. I would say that the, the real impact of optogenetics is, is a basic science discovery tool, though this is by far the biggest impact. Uh, this mm -hmm. allows us to understand, to build up a, a causal understanding of the brain in a way that, that matters. And 
that could make any kind of treatment more effective, more potent, more specific. If you really know what matters, if you know what's causal in a symptom of a, of a disorder, then you can bring anything to bear on it. You can bring a much better targeted electrical stimulation, a much uh, more precisely targeted medication or a combination thereof, armed with grounded in this, this causal and specific understanding. So that's the real value of optogenetics. It's, it's for understanding, it's for insight, it's for discovery, and it can make any kind of uh, treatment more, more potent and effective. Mm -hmm. So some of the treatments we have today for, for certain debilitating brain problems are fairly invasive and fairly crude. So one that I'm thinking of is deep brain stimulation. Could you imagine a point in the near future where we are using optogenetics in a human being in place of something like deep brain stimulation? I, I think that's plausible. Uh, you know, an interesting thing about deep brain stimulation is uh, it's pretty good, uh, particularly for Parkinson's and, and for some related disorders. How does it work? Uh, what we do is we put an electrode uh, into a deep structure. Sometimes it's a bilateral electrode. So you put in two, one on each side, and you go down to a structure like the subthalamic nucleus, and you stimulate very hard electrically. And so it's not specific in the sense you're not hitting one cell type, but you're having a regional effect. And that biases a Parkinsonian brain away from this state of slow movement and rigid limbs and high likelihood of falling and tremor. And it, and it restores uh, a brain state that's uh, more fluid, not so slow, not so much of a tremor. And that's how it works. And it works for about, uh, it, you know, because it's brain surgery and because it's invasive, it's not, it's not the first line or second line therapy. It's reserved for people who, for whom medications like dopamine replacement medications have stopped working. And for those people, it works for about half of them quite well. And it, and it, it only gets some symptoms, but not others, but it gets those pretty well. Uh, it, it doesn't help so much with the depression and the dementia and the gait problems that come with Parkinson's, but it helps with other things. And, but the problem is it stops working after a few years also. It works, it helps with, with function for a while and then it stops uh, much like the other medications as the disease uh, progresses. So that's deep brain stimulation. Now you think, well, so could, could optogenetics or something like it, uh, help in a way that deep brain stimulation doesn't. One problem is we still don't really understand uh, fully if we were to use the specificity of optogenetics, we don't yet know. And certainly for psychiatry, we don't yet know exactly how to use that power. Uh, and this is why this work with animal subjects, uh, you know, experimental work in the laboratory over you know, the coming decades is, is gonna be so important. We have to use this power to, to figure out which are the cell types, the connection types that we need to target. Um, brain's a very complex place. If we don't know that, you're never gonna be able to, to help human beings. The specificity is almost gonna be a handicap at this point, because if you come in with a very specific intervention, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna be wrong. Uh, and you're gonna be targeting the cells or their projections that are actually not causal. So uh, really what we have is a situation where we now have the the power to ask the questions and get the answers that we want. And, but there's going to be a, a long discovery process, particularly uh, for psychiatry. So one of the things you mentioned earlier was to do with anxiety and that anxiety is very multifaceted. It's not just one thing. It's actually several different components, each of which is controlled to some extent by different projections, different circuits within the brain. Can you unpack for people a little bit how optogenetics and other techniques used in neuroscience have helped give us that more detailed level of understanding and then what achieving that has done for you so far on the psychiatry side? Yeah. Yeah. And this is something that, that I talk about in projections in the book, uh, 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 in a number of different ways about anxiety and also about this parenting work that came from uh, Catherine Dulac's lab at, at Harvard. And the way optogenetics was used in both of these studies for anxiety and for parenting was as follows. So what we can do is ask, if we define a cell type as a cell type that has its 
origin, its cell body, where the cell itself lives in one part of the brain, and but it sends a connection. It sends an outgoing axon, an outgoing wire, a projection from one part of the brain to another. That's one kind of cell. It's a cell that uh, it may have other connections, but it certainly has that one. And it appears, therefore, to be designed to be sending information from point A to point B. Okay. Now, so how, how can you begin to dis deconstruct a brain state and a complex behavior uh, using this framework? Well, what we can do is we can inject a uh, effectively the gene that encodes a channel rhodopsin, a light activated protein. We can put that into point A, into, into one spot of the brain, maybe here, we put it in here. And if we put that in, if this part of the brain is an anxiety control region, a region that we know is linked to anxiety, then we could make all the cells in that area uh, produce this channel rhodopsin protein and make them light responsive. But the neat trick is we don't send the light into point A. Instead, we send the light into point B. And what's light sensitive in point B? Are there any channel rhodopsins in point B? There are but they're only in the wires that started here because this is where the cells got the channel rhodopsin gene and they produced a lot of the channel rhodopsin. The channel rhodopsin went down the axons, went down the outgoing wires. And so the only light sensitive things here in point B are the axons that started here and ended here and define that cell type. And so that we call projection targeting. Uh, and so, uh, of course, it comes up in projections quite a bit. And in this anxiety control region, there are some axons that go to regions of the brain that control breathing. There are some that control, go to regions of the brain that control behavioral choices. Uh, and there are those that control valence, that control positivity or negativity of a state or an experience. And what we found was that different connections coming from point A, from the anxiety region, there was one connection that effectively went out and got the respiratory rate changes, breathing fast when you're anxious. Another connection went out and got the negative valence the, uh, or the positive valence of relief from anxiety. And another one went out and got the behavioral change. And so the complex state of anxiety was assembled from its component parts by these projections that went out to different parts of the brain. And optogenetics gave us this ability to specifically recruit one or another or another of these sub features of anxiety and see how it's assembled. That's the case of anxiety. What Catherine Duloc's lab did is they were looking at parenting uh, and you might not think that that could be studied sort of quantitatively and tract tractably in the lab, but she's done such a great job of this kind of work. And she was able to set up experiments that separated different parts of parenting. Now, anybody who has been a parent or even has been around little kids, which is everybody, uh, you know, you know that there are different aspects of caring for, for kids. Um, a big part of that is just keeping them contained. Okay. You got to, <laughs> keep them in one spot. And if some of them get away, you got to go get them and bring them back. Okay. That's completely separate from anything else you might do for the kids. Okay. You might, you might want to give them a bath and you might want to teach them something, but all of that is separate from just going to get them and bringing them back. Okay. And that, I, you know, I've got a bunch of little kids. A big part of my life is just going to get them and bring them back. And, and that turns out in a parenting part of the brain, there's a whole projection in, in mice that is effective effectively that part of parenting. It's like, mm -hmm. go out and get them and bring them back. And, and so that's, you know, talk about feeling connected across the tree of life. You know, when you see a mouse that, you know, big <laughs> part of its parenting experience is just going to get the wayward kids and bring them back. You, you really feel connected with them. Okay. So that's, but then once you have them back, then how do you get, um, you know, uh, what do you do then? Well, there's, if you're a mouse, there's a lot of grooming and, 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 and that kind of care. And it turns out there's another projection. So there's the go out and get them projection, which is from point A to one part of the brain, but that doesn't control grooming. There's another one that starts from point A and goes to another part of the brain and that controls the grooming. 
And what the Dulac Lab was able to do was turn up or down each of these projections and make things happen, uh, specifically going out and retrieving the, the young or, or grooming them. And so in both these cases, we see that the these complex mammalian behavioral states are assembled, are put together by the projections by the connections that go out and get particular subparts of the state. And that's the unifying theme. Mm -hmm. And so is it common that you have this kind of configuration where you've got a group of cells with their cell bodies in one part of the brain, and then some of them go to one place, some of them go to another place. Is that kind of configuration where those different projections are controlling different aspects of something, but they're all originating from the same spot and coordinated in that sense? Is that uh, a, a good motif or a good configuration if you want to make a complex behavior like anxiety or like parenting? Yeah, it, it, it certainly seems to work well. It, it seems to be, uh, first of all, a, a, uh, a generalizable theme that works across multiple different uh, brain states and behavioral states, and it, it does seem to work well. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. It's logical. It helps compartmentalize different features of, of a state. There might be something that needs to be shared across multiple states, and there are other things that should not be shared or should be shared in a, in a, among a different set of states. And so having this um, modular organization of, of features of states is actually, if you think about it, a very reasonable way of, of setting things up. And But we didn't really know until we had this, this causal uh, way of addressing uh, uh, projections uh, with optogenetics, we didn't really know that this uh, sort of organization uh, mattered or that it was uh, generalizable. Now it makes a lot of sense and, and it, it does seem to be a, 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 a general principle. So another emotion or rather another behavior that I thought was interesting that I learned something about from the book is crying, crying in humans, something that we've all done. We've all experienced uh, crying sort of interesting because you can cry for multiple reasons. You can cry because you're sad. You can cry because you're angry or even if you're in a state of joy. I can also think of examples from you know earlier in my own life where I cried for one of those reasons, but I didn't necessarily want to display that emotion to other people, but I just couldn't help it. And you talk about crying and tears in the book and so can you talk about the part where, well, I, I didn't know this before, but crying is, I believe, has some specificity to humans, and I wouldn't ne necessarily have guessed that. But why do we produce tears, and, and what is crying actually doing for humans? Yeah. yeah, this is really interesting. And so here in this chapter, so I mentioned how in different chapters, the, the language is adapted to the, the nature of the human condition that's involved. And so in mania, we have this sort of flowery uh, language, and but that's not seen in this in this chapter on on tears and crying. There, it's it's really um, uh, that the, the language is much more attuned to this to this loss and and, and grief uh, part of the story. Now, uh, crying is indeed the, the shedding of emotional tears is human specific. Even other great apes. Uh, they they don't uh, shed emotional tears from their eyes, and so uh, and of course uh, they certainly have expressions of, of of what look like grief and loss and bereavement for sure. But but the the shedding of emotional tears does seem human specific, which is pretty interesting. And you also highlight that it's uh, it's involuntary, largely. Uh, People have to work really hard. Even trained actors have a really hard time. Many can do it, but but only with a lot of training. In general, uh, people have trouble controlling them. Causing tears to happen when when you're not in one of these states is hard. Suppressing the shedding of tears is extremely hard, if not impossible, in in, in these states. And and as you point out, that doesn't seem an advantage to the individual, right? Why? Should an involuntary expression of this emotion be something we we have uh, any complex sign that we have? We should have it for a reason. We know things that aren't useful in evolution are lost quickly. This is a, a nearly universal human trait, uh, 
What's, what's its value? And what is the value of the involuntary nature of crying? Well, we don't know, but we can look at the circumstances that cause or suppress crying, and we can think about the value of, not for the individual, but for the species of involuntary communication of emotion. And here, there's a value of truth, of true social communication about true deep feelings. We know when we have feelings of loss, uh, a sudden shock of betrayal, a need to recreate our world, our model of the world. We cry at those moments and we're conveying something that is very powerful to other people. It's, it's been documented in very nice studies that just by adding, digitally adding tears or taking them away from images of people has a much more profound effect on the desire to help, specifically that, the desire to help mm. than any other feature that you could, you could digitally alter. And so here's what we now know from the science is that this is an involuntary human specific trait that powerfully and specifically recruits a desire to help in others. And, and it matters for the species that it be true, which is really interesting, right? If it were too easily gamed, it would uh, not be not perhaps so good for the species as a whole as this uh, a channel of true communication. There's also an interesting, I think, uh, part of the tears of joy, uh, which um, uh, might be best to read the, the story, uh, might be too long to get into here, but the tears of joy are also quite interesting as well. Um, so there is this concept of the, the truth channel and, and why we, how this shedding of emotional tears from the lacrimal gland in our eye, it's controlled from a, a deep brainstem structure, the, the pons, uh, which there's a particular cluster of neurons there in the, in, in, in a, a particular nucleus of, the, of this uh, deep structure that sends connections to the, the tear ducts and the, the tear glands and triggers the release of tears. How did that get, how did that feature get looped into this state of grief and, and loss? Well, it's, it's, you know, because this is a human specific trait, of course, we don't have all the detailed knowledge that we now have for, for analogous things in mice, but clearly these cells that control the tear glands and the release of, of tears, they must now be this feature of, uh, of crying has now been added into the grief state by a projection that comes from the emotional parts of the brain and that finds its way directly or indirectly to uh, this deep brainstem structure and triggers the release of tears. And so it's a, a, a beautiful case uh, study that, that, nature has given us of how a feature of a state, in this case, the shedding of a fluid from, from a duct can be specifically added to an emotional uh, state. And so this, it becomes a, a paradigm when you think about how our, our complex inner worlds are constructed and, and created with a simple expedient of adding a, a connection or a projection, you can begin to define uh, the material nature of our mysterious inner states. Another thing that I found fascinating in the book was how you talked about the value of basic research, undirected basic research with, with no apparent purpose to it, no applied purpose. Because on the one hand, you're a psychiatrist, so you have this sort of very applied side to your professional life. You're helping people in need and you've got that. And then on the other side, you've got the basic research where you're using things like optogenetics and other tools to ask basic questions that inform that. But, but you actually go further than that and say something like, the more we try to direct research by concentrating public funding into large projects with targeted uh, possible treatments in mind, the more likely we are to instead slow progress. So you seem to be advocating not just for basic research, but basic research that doesn't even try to apply itself to, towards some practical end. Why is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, it, it, here again, it's the, it's the, what optogenetics has taught us is something that we have learned and will learn again, which is you can't predict where these big insights, big, you know, 
changes in, in the landscape of, of science and understanding where, where revolutions will come from. You can't dictate that I, I will understand uh, emotion and psychiatry better by studying single-celled algae. Nobody could have uh, said that at the beginning, right? Um, it would, and, and that's the point, uh, is that we were only able to make the advances that, that we made because of more than 150 years of pure exploratory curiosity, human curiosity about the world. In 1866, a, a Russian named Andrei Fomenzin, a botanist, was studying these single-celled green algae, and he noticed that some of them move toward light. They have little flagella, and they swim toward the light. If you just have them in a dish, you collect these algae from a dish, and you put them near a light, they'll swim to just the right light level for their photosynthesis. Why was he studying that? He certainly wasn't thinking about, you know, emotion or or parenting, I think. Um, there was no plausible research plan that would have said we will study this to, to, to deepen our understanding of neurology or psychiatry, but that's, that's what he studied. And uh, other curiosity-driven work led to discovery of other uh, microbial opsins, wonderful work from uh, my friends and colleagues, Dieter Osterhelt and Peter Hegemann and others. And, and then, you know, we delved deep into how these proteins work. Uh, we discovered more of them. We got the high resolution structures of all the main types of channel rhodopsins and looked to understand how this light activated ion flow works. We were able to redesign them for new kinds of function that let us uh, do new kinds of experiments, including these single cell holographic experiments. And, and all of this, if you look at this in aggregate, none of it would have been possible without 150 years ago, just, just pure exploration of the natural world. And so that's kind of the point is that, um, you know, we, we definitely do need, you know, directed translational research, but we also need an extremely large component of what we do to be pure exploration because uh, uh, no human being can predict where the big uh, uh, leverage will come from. Are we doing enough curiosity-driven research today? And how does that relate to the, the general structure of how science is funded in the present day? Yeah, this is a big question. Um, I think we're, we're doing pretty well. Uh, I think we could do better. Um, I've noticed a shift uh, in the last uh, you know, 25 years more toward application and translation being uh, more dominant. When I was a neuroscience uh, graduate student, uh, you know, anybody who had a translational or medical inspiration to their work, it was kind of, it was a little weird. It, it was sort of, hmm, are you, are you a real scientist or what's, what's going on here? Um, it was uncool. It was definitely uncool. Definitely uncool. And that's, changed uh big time so now the neuroscience students you know i was at stanford same institution the same program um now the students love talking about translation and, and application they're, they're they're great on the basic science side too but they're fully uh, excited and happy to talk about uh, translation uh, and, and medical applications so that's pretty cool on the one side as long as they don't lose that, that basic side and, and, and don't, but of course it's, you know, there's only so many hours in a day and there's only so many, you know, grant dollars out there. And um, if you take from something, if you give something, you take from something else to some extent. Um, I think it's, I think we just have to make sure that, that we continue this very healthy respect uh, for, for the purely undirected uh, research at the same time as we, uh, increasingly respect and appreciate translation. So you also write in the book, one of the sentences I highlight highlighted was mm -hmm. the experiences of suffering human beings and the thoughts and thoughts about mouse and fish brains are informing each other. So talking about the, the 
influence that the basic and the applied side are having on one another. We've already talked about this with some examples, but are there other salient examples you can give from your own career about how this kind of direct bi-directional influence between the psychiatry practice and the basic research has, has played out? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I mentioned my clinical focus is, is on depression and also autism and it's been really good. Uh, uh, I think for, for everybody that, that I can walk from this world from this office here and I can, where I see patients, where I, I treat them, uh, and go back to the lab. And, and if my graduate students in the lab who are studying, uh, you know, anxiety in, 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 in mice or, or social interaction in mice or, you know, um, decisions of, of fish to, to flee from something aversive or, or to stay put. Um, instead of the students just opening up, you know, a textbook and saying, okay, here are the five of nine symptoms required to diagnose depression. If they can talk to me as they do, as we, and we talk about this and, and they can ask, what's the, what's the patient really like? What, what really matters to them? What's the, what are the important parts of it? What are the ones that, that strike most to the heart of, of the disorder itself? Um, and, and I've been able to do that for depression, for autism, for dissociation. We just, you know, we just had a paper last year on this very interesting brain state of dissociation that where people feel separated from their body, their sense of self become separated from their sense of their physical body. That sounds probably very fuzzy and weird and non-precise, but actually <laughs> turns out it's, first of all, it's, it's very tractable. And as we found can be rigorously studied and quantitatively and causally. And secondly, a lot of people don't realize, but it's epidemiologically quite common. It's, you know, up to 70% of people who have trauma will experience dissociation. It's caused by drugs, but it's caused by personality disorders. You see it in PTSD. And so the nature of my, you know, work with, with patients has helped us, has helped give us a, a firm foundation to explore things in ways that are really grounded in the human experience of, of people and in ways that matter. And so that that has been really uh, powerful and, and in surprising ways, always ongoing with each year, each new project. I see that happen again and again. It's so good to have this grounding in the, the human experience on the, on the clinical side. Hmm. And so that's what I meant with that passage is, is to see that the, the insights and motivation that come from the mouse and fish work, of course, they inform, you know, how we think about ourselves and our, our suffering. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a cycle. I, I do that work in part because of my inspiration from psychiatry and then it comes back and, and helps us understand the psychiatry as well. Yeah. Dissociation is a very interesting phenomenon. On the one hand, as you say, it's, it's common. Lots of people experience this. It can arise in many different contexts. On the other hand, if you haven't experienced it or you haven't seen it firsthand, it's right. It's interesting. It's very hard to wrap your mind around how something like this could even be possible. What do we know about the neural basis of dissociation? Well, we knew uh, essentially nothing uh, because, first of all, uh, there was not a clear path to studying it in animals and although it happens in human beings, we didn't have the tools to get in with the right resolution into the brain to see what was actually happening. So we were sort of paralyzed on both fronts, the, the animal subject and the, the clinical side for different reasons. Um, and so in this, in this uh, uh, paper that we published uh, uh, last year in, in 2020 uh, in, in nature, the the uh, exploration was both in mice and in human beings. And the basic 
approach started was was with uh, first of all a new way of looking at the brain. It was a what we call wide field optics. So we were able to take a very broad view across all of what we call dorsal cortex. So the whole uh, surface part of the brain of a mouse all at once, true simultaneity, not like looking at one part and then another part, but looking at the whole thing all at once. And by doing that and giving uh, drugs that are dissociative agents, ketamine or PCP, we just looked, we didn't know what we would see. It was a pure exploration, curiosity driven exploration. We asked, okay, what if we give dissociative drugs or versus non-dissociative drugs, do we see anything happening in the brain? So we were imaging the brain, looking at activity using light. There are ways of, of collecting activity information using light also, fluorescence changes that come with neural activity. And so we used our wide field optics and these light driven reporters, readouts of neural activity. And we saw something amazing that within one little patch of the mammalian brain called retrosplenial cortex, there was a pulsation, an oscillation that was going about three times a second. And it was only in this one spot, retrosplenial cortex. And in fact, it started in layer five, this deep layer of retrosplenial cortex it wasn't happening anywhere else in this, this dorsal cortex part of the brain. And we, we were very curious about that. It was a very localized rhythm. It was only in the dissociative drugs, not the others. It, it happened just at the dose where behaviors that looked like dissociation happened in the mice where, hmm. uh, so you might ask how are you going to make that happen? Well, if you give a very mildly aversive stimulus to a mouse, like a, a, a plate that's too warm, It'll withdraw, reflexively withdraw its paw, and then it's fine. And that's a reflexive thing. It just means it's detecting the stimulus. But then uh, a normal mouse will also then lick the paw to cool it. And what we found is that animals that we'd given a dissociative drug to, ketamine or PCP, they would still detect the stimulus and withdraw the paw, but they wouldn't do anything else. They, they wouldn't carry out the self-care, the licking, and so on that, hmm. that, that you would carry out. So they just didn't care that it happened. And, and I know from patients uh, and, and people know, and this is, there's no question about this. This is very similar to what happens to people who are dissociating. They're aware of what's happening. They're not numb. They're not unconscious. They're not anesthetized. They perfectly register what's happening to the body. They just don't care because it's not their self anymore. Hmm. So this is extremely interesting is that there's a separation of stimulus detection from, from caring about it because it, you, it's attributed to the self or not. Well, that's exactly what the mice did at exactly the dose that where this oscillation appeared in retrosplenal cortex, they stopped caring about the stimulus that they were detecting. Um, and, and we did other experiments. We uh, caused the oscillation using optogenetics. So we played in we delivered this oscillation into this, you know, layer five retrosplenial cortex, and we were able to cause a behavioral dissociation. And then we delved deeper into the mechanism. We found a ion channel, a native naturally present channel that we had pacemaker properties. It's also expressed in the heart, which, which has its own pace that it sets. And so it creates its own rhythm. And we, we saw that this was a gene that was very highly expressed in this particular layer of retrosplenial cortex. And so we knocked it out just in that spot and the rhythm disappeared and, and the behavior also disappeared. And so all this seemed consistent. Then you might ask, how are you going to bring this to human? Cause you, you can't do all this stuff in humans. You can't knock out this, this gene in the human uh, brain, for example, but we had, an, there was an amazing uh, and unpredictable, you know, convergence of, of events. So I host a, uh, a, a get together basically of, of neuroscience clinicians at Stanford it, in the pre pandemic days, it was basically sandwiches. I would just put a order, a bunch of sandwiches, put them in a big pile and invite neurosurgeons and neurologists, anesthesiologists, psychiatrists, um, to just come and talk. And we would talk about our, Experiments. They would talk about their cases. Uh, 
And one day uh, the students were talking about this work and one of the neurosurgeons, Jamie Henderson, said, hey, you know, we've got a patient uh, on our epilepsy service who's coming in so we can map where the seizure is starting so we can go in and take it out because this patient had intractable epilepsy. The medications weren't working, so they have to go in and find where the seizure is starting. And he said, this patient has a dissociative aura. <laughs> An aura is this thing right before a seizure, before it starts, where the patient starts to feel different. People with migraine also have an aura. And, and so that's it's what happens just before the event. This was a patient whose aura was dissociating. So, okay, that's interesting. But even more interesting, what happens in our Stanford Comprehensive Epilepsy Treatment Center is when you go in and take out part of the brain, you want to be pretty sure you're taking out the right part, right? So before the neurosurgeon goes in and takes out what he thinks is the seizure focus, what Jamie Henderson thinks the seizure focus is, what he's going to do is first say, hey, you've got to put in electrodes across the brain and the neurologists do this too. The, uh, Joseph Parvizi, the neurologist was, uh, you know, they work together to plot the course of the electrodes and they want to put them in and record from everywhere so they can see, okay, where's the seizure really starting? And then they can also stimulate with those electrodes too and see, can we cause a seizure at this spot? So there's this whole week long process of mapping the seizure origin. And as part of that normal clinical care, there's electrodes all in the brain, which is not a normal thing that you, you typically have with people. So we were, we were like, Oh my gosh, this is a patient who's dissociating and as part of their normal care, there's electrodes all over the brain. So in you, the have, brain. you now have the ability to locate the origin of this dissociation effect. Yeah, so, exactly. So we said, this is incredible. So it was like a beautiful blind experiment because all that had been collected, all the planning of electro trajectories and all that had already been done. So it was not searching under the streetlight of where we expected something to happen. It was a purely unbiased exploration. And we went and looked. And we know, by the way, exactly when the patient's dissociating and they're describing it. And we saw an oscillation. It was about three hertz. <laughs> and it was only in these areas of the brain that are homologous to the mouse retrosplenial cortex. It's the human retrosplenial and deep posteromedial cortices. Same rhythm, same spot. And it happened only when the patient was dissociating, telling us that dissociation was happening. And it was causal too, because when stimulation happened at these spots, but not at the non-oscillating spots, the patient uh, dissociated as well. And he had these classic descriptions of feeling separated from his, his, of a self feeling separated from his body. He described feeling pulled out of the cockpit of the plane, mm -hmm. seeing all the gauges, seeing all the information, knowing it's there, knowing exactly what's happening, but not feeling that it was, was him. You're not the pilot, but you're in the cockpit. Exactly. Hmm. Definitely not in the pilot's chair, but seeing the gauges. And so that was amazing. Uh, and then we did, there's a bunch more work in that paper. And now we're following up in various ways where we think we understand aspects of how this now happens. We think the this, this retrosplenial cortex is potently connected to one part of the deep brain called the thalamus. And this rhythm sets up a, a loop and that excludes other parts of thalamus that are not connected to this part of the brain and they end up on their own loop. So you've got half the brain in one rhythm, half the brain out of sync on this other rhythm and different parts of the brain are not active together. And so they can't engage with the same information at, this, at the same time. Neither part is shut down, neither part is unconscious, but they're just never active together. And so they can't form a, a, a shared unified experience uh, of of uh, the uh, situation or the event. So we're even getting now down to, to these very deep questions of what we talk about something like the self and why do we consider our body part of ourself anyway? Mm -hmm. Well, now that might seem like a impossible question to address, although interesting, but now uh, with this combination of optogenetics and, and working with patients and this, this undirected imaging, we're now, we now have a, 
a, a, a very interesting toehold on that very deep question. Hmm. So this is making me think about something like treatment resistant depression, which you've got a lot of experience in and, you know, at a very fuzzy non-mechanistic level, right? Someone with severe depression, I, I would think must, you know, in some sense have an altered model of themselves. People tend to, you know, have very negative thoughts and you're the way that you're modeling yourself seems, seems like it's different in some way. And so connecting everything that you just said about dissociation to something like ketamine, for example, which is a dissociative drug. I've had a couple people on the podcast talking about recent results showing that ketamine can have these rapid antidepressant effects. And, you know, one might, might think, okay, well, if there's a problem with how you're modeling yourself, reviewing yourself in something like depression, say, and you've got a dissociative drug causing dissociative effects, you know, maybe it's conceivable that dissoci dissociation can be helpful because it can help you maybe uh, dissociate from this maladaptive model of yourself and maybe maybe reassociate some other other more more adaptive model. But the thing that would then confuse me there is people are seeing these antidepressant effects with ketamine at low doses where you don't get dissociation. So do you have any thoughts about how something like ketamine might be working to cause its antidepressant effects? Yeah, this is a really great question. We thought about a lot. I don't have the answers. I have some thoughts though. Um, and I've talked to various people in the field. There are a lot of theories on how ketamine, and you're correct, the dosing is, is different. And so the antidepressant dosing and the dissociative uh, uh, dosing are not quite the same. So that's one, one suggestion that, you know, it may, it may not be that the antidepressant actions are because of dissociation. I think m probably most people now, uh, uh, think that, although it's not, not proven. So, I, um, and you know, it's, it could have been right. It could have been that, that maybe there's a separation from negative things and that's part of how the antidepressant works of dissociating of, of negative things from the self. But that is probably not the case. The dosing is different. Um, some people think the uh, ketamine and antidepressant action is acting on different brain structures more directly, not on the retrosplenial cortex per se. Um, some people, uh, including here at Stanford, uh, uh, find evidence that it may be acting through uh, opioid receptors. Uh, other people are, are, are finding evidence for other parts of the brain. So they may well be different actions uh, for, for ketamine uh, per se. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, it doesn't really matter to some extent. Uh, it, it's, we can study both separately and independently and the, the wonderful thing about these advanced molecular tools is we can start from these initial observations as we did. We gave the dissociative drug, we saw this oscillation, and then we can dive deep into these mechanisms and, and processes and get, you know, precise causal understanding and, and not so much depend on the initial experiments, the initial drug application. That was just our, our way in. That's what got us into these deep questions in the first place. So what do you make of some of the findings related to, say, ketamine and psychedelics on treatment-resistant depression? We've had, you know, you, you, you'll know better than me and you'll be able to tell us about the history of depression and, you know, how successful classic treatments have been, what fraction of people they've worked for. But there's, I think, a fairly large proportion of people that are treatment-resistant and that classic treatments don't work for. And it seems like some of these drugs that you wouldn't necessarily have thought would have, have worked for something like depression even just a few years ago are having effects that seem to be beneficial for, for some people with things like treatment resistant depression. So what do you make of, of that general field? I'm intrigued by it. I, I think it's, it's definitely worthy of exploration uh, and the results are, are intriguing. Uh, no, no doubt about it. Um, I have a, um, you know, from, from speaking to people who've, who've, uh, who explored this, this path, it's, it's clear that, and this is both a positive aspect and a cautionary note, is many times people who have taken psychedelic medication, they describe it as sort of an opening up of possibilities, and they never quite 
go back to how they were ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. So this is, this is interesting. It is. Um, and as I said, it's, it's good and bad, right? You, you know, this could be, if you do it right, it's the foundation for a great kind of treatment, right? You open up the brain to a new way of being that it never had access to before a new way of experiencing the world of the self of creating a, a unified uh, and consistent picture. Uh, we're in one mode for much of our lives. For some people, that's great. For other people, they end up in, in a state of suffering or, or dysfunction, opening up a new way of being is potentially great uh this you know we have treatments in psychiatry like electroconvulsive therapy which are very effective we don't know how they work that's very non-specific it's all over the brain it's probably just opening up a new set of possibilities a new way of things happening and these microdoses may be doing something analogous now what's the downside well things never quite go back to how they were, um, you know, there are potentially very serious uh, complications and risks that, that come with that. Um, you know, you know, some people, their lives are quite sadly, uh, of their, the nature of their daily experience is, is great suffering. And of course, no problem in seeking, you know, ways for those people to, to find a new way of, of being, particularly patients who are treatment resistant, suicidal, you know, uh, no question. We want to help those, those patients, but for people who may be more on the mild or moderate spectrum are not yet quite established as truly treatment resistant people whose current mode of being may be pretty good in other ways. Um, functional people with, with jobs and families, we have to think hard about this. What, what, what could we be altering, uh, in a way that we don't understand and, and might not be able to reverse uh, with these approaches. So that's that's the caution. Um, as with everything, I think we need to study it. Uh, we need to understand what we're doing. And here's where, you know, in our dissociation work, I think was helpful in this. You don't have to just throw up your hands and say, well, we can't study things like this in, in animals or we can't go back and forth from, from mouse to human and back again. Well, you can, you can, uh, if you have an integrated set of people uh, unified in the, their willingness to talk to each other, to, to share data, to explore together. And I think that's the path forward with the psychedelics and the, the microdosing. We, we need to ground ourselves in, in a deep understanding of what we're actually doing. And, and, and we're, we're exploring that here. We have, I have a, a safe <laughs> with LSD and we've got, you know, we have, we're doing, collaborations on MDMA and, and obviously we're doing a lot with ketamine and PCP. We're, we're, we're doing the, the basic work, uh, but with a, a firm grounding in causal, rigorous, cellular uh, mechanisms. I want to ask you about autism as well. This is an area that a lot of people have interest in for personal <laughs> and academic reasons. Can you speak a little bit about what autism is and what we've maybe started to learn in the past five to 10 years about how the, the brain of an autistic person is different from that of a neurotypical person. Yeah, so autism uh, always intrigued me. Uh, I was so uh, both dismayed and intrigued by how physically, you know, undamaged these people and their brains are. In fact, many people with autism, their brains are larger even uh, uh, than a a typical brain. Um, And there's no real structural problem. There's no real EEG thing. You can, maybe there's a little more power in one band of the spectrum, you know, maybe in, in some forms of the disorder you can see there's a few more of one kind of cell than another um but in general brains look fine body is fine uh and yet you can have very severe dysfunction in these very specific domains um and autism is defined by deficits in communication and social interaction 
and also by, in many cases, stereotyped or repetitive, repetitive behaviors. And why do these go together? And what's the mechanism? Where does it come from? Now, there are a lot of genes that are associated with autism. It's very genetically associated. Um, but we, that those genes don't fall into a, a simple picture. Some of those genes are related to synapses. Some of those genes are related to projections across the brain. Um, some are related to chromatin, how DNA is wound up and structured within the nucleus of a cell. Why chromatin? Nobody knows. Um, so it doesn't fall into a, a neat picture. Um, there are some themes though, some, some, some uh, sort of little cracks in the, in, in, the, in the door that let us peer into this mystery. One of them is that uh, there's a theme of over excitation, of over excitability. And this, a number of different things point in the same direction. So uh, first of all, people who have autism are more likely to have epilepsy, more likely to have seizures. Um, and so there's association with over excitability. There is more of this high frequency power in one band of the spectrum on, on average in people with autism. So there's a, there's a little more power in that, uh, in that spectrum and their brain activity. And then uh, there's a lot of their behavioral uh, properties and symptoms that re sort of suggest this uh, preponderance of, of excitation. There, uh, uh, there's um, a, uh, uh, an uh, ease of being overwhelmed, a susceptibility to being overwhelmed by, by things. Um, and this shows up in, could even be simple sounds, unexpected sounds or touches, but then certainly uh, social interaction, very rich in information. You know, you think of all the streams of information that, that you're synthesizing to make sense of what I'm saying. You've got I've got my hands here. I've got the, the you know, you, there's the eye contact, there's whatever facial expression I've got. And then there's the complexity of the words coming out in the sentences. You're, as you're listening, you're fusing all those together into this model of me and what I'm saying. And that that's human social communication. It's extremely information rich. There's a lot of it. Patients with autism experience that is very overwhelming, that that information rate itself, it's just too much and they can't keep up with it. And that the great value, and I talk about this in projections uh, as well, is and, and discussing with my, my patients, they very much endorse this um, concept of being overwhelmed by the information, by the rate of information. It's not so much that they couldn't grasp any one part of it, but it's 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 the rate of information flow. And so this is this is a very I think interesting and helpful way to look at this and, and optogenetics and work in animals has also given us a window into this as well. We've been able to test questions like, is, is there a causal significance of over excitation relative to inhibition uh, in, in terms of how social interaction happens? And we were able to find uh, quite a bit of evidence for that. And so it's a, it's a pretty interesting, you know, process where again, the, the animal work and the, the human clinical work are helping each other and helping us move, move toward understanding. Are there any fields of neuroscience that you're particularly excited about that, that are making really nice progress right now that are maybe not, uh, not as sexy as some of the other fields that get a lot of attention? Uh, well, um, you know, one thing with optogenetics that's been great is how almost everybody who's been interested in trying it has found it useful. And this is uh, across, you know, for people studying worms to fish, uh, insects, uh, um, mice, rats, monkeys, and now human. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I think these value judgments of, you know, what's the hot area, um, you know, it's, I think there's a real risk uh, in, in people being too excited by what's the, the, the current hot area and not paying enough attention to, to where truly, uh, you know, surprising or shocking or unusual discoveries might come from. 
we we started in my lab a whole fish effort because um, we wanted to work with uh, much smaller transparent brains where we could count all the cells where there were relatively fewer cells and where we could see and control almost all the cells individually. And a lot of people were surprised that that you know a psychiatrist uh, like me would would put so much effort into into fish. Um, but it's been really helpful. We turns out they have a lot of the same you know uh, behaviors. Even even very young you know barely barely hatched uh, larval zebrafish they they do something very interesting. They they give up. Uh, if a situation seems insuperable, that it, it can't solve a problem, they'll try for a little bit and then they'll just give up. They'll answer into this passive state. And we were able to, to look at the brain structures and networks that underlie this state transition to this passive coping state. And it's a lot of the same structures that are present in mammals and that have been associated with depression and, and the giving up the, the, the passive coping the lack of motivation lack of energy to 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 meet challenges that comes with depression so i would just i would i, I think it's it's great to study <laughs> small strange organisms uh that you might not expect uh to give insight um nature always instructs us where you know preconceived ideas are usually wrong we have to keep our, our eyes open, our minds open, and explore freely. And I think that means looking at the brains of, of whatever nature has, has to give us. Well, Carl, before we go, do you have any final thoughts you want to leave people with about the stories of human emotion generally? Well, the, you know, for me, it was such a, uh, an important moment to, to, to write the book, uh, Projections, uh, um, because it brought these different parts of the excitement of the science and the, these universal human experiences of, of, you know, altered states, whether in, in grief or in, in, in psychiatric disorders, and bring them all together in ways that, that I think help people understand themselves and the course of human history um, uh, more deeply. It was a, um, for me, it was an, an interesting exploration into myself as well. I came to understand myself a lot better after writing the book. And it actually, it's kind of funny as when I wrote, was writing the epilogue, I was looking back and I noticed, you know, themes in the book that <laughs> told me uh, a little bit about myself that I maybe haven't quite fully appreciated. So it was, it was a really, uh, a powerful experience to, to, to put it out there and, and to try to live in the mind and to express in the words and in the style, the, the inner experience of, of these disorders. But I, uh, I have the, just the greatest um, um, respect and, uh, you know, deep uh, uh, empathy for everyone around the world who is, uh, experiencing the suffering of these disorders. And I, I, I just want to pass along that there is hope um, that I think that's the main message of, of, of the book and where things are is that, you know, we may not, we definitely don't have all the answers now, but, but there's hope. There is hope now. Um, we're, we've come to a point in human history where our, our, our scientific explorations uh, are converging with these, states that have been part of us as, as people in humanity uh, for so long. Carl Dysroth, thank you for your time. Thank you.